Cool. So this is um, some work I've been doing in Access CM2 on pacemakers. Um, we're using pacemaker style experiments. Um, and I'm just going to talk about like kind of like what I what I, like some of the past experiments I've done, some of the challenges I've had with setting up new ones, and some of the results briefly. Um, so a bit of background on why I've done these. Um, so ST bias in a lot of coupled models still exists. This figure shows CNIP5 and CNIP6, um, and there's still quite significant biases there. Um, these can lead to significantly different precipitation or surface temperature. Um, so it's important how we understand both the impacts and drivers of SST bias. Um, model biases impact things like the Indian Ocean Dipole. So in both segment five and six, ID is too strong uh, and peaks in the wrong month. Um, and some analysis across using intermodal correlations showed that ID strength is linked to the strength of SST in models. So blue in these plots indicates models with full SST have a stronger ID and red where models have a warm ST in that region have a stronger ID. Um, so what these kind of plots are saying is that these regions of biased SST in the Pacific, this is for CMIP5 on the left and then CMIP6 on the right, sorry. Uh, these regions of biased SST are associated with increased ID strength in CMIP models. Um, so we wanted to find out, is this association just due to the biases in climate models or is it due to ENSO? Um, so this is what the bias in Access CM2 looks like. We've got this equatorial cold, um, let me just turn on my pointer. Oh, uh, so we've got this equatorial cold bias and this warm bias in the East Pacific, and then a uh, warm bias over the maritime continent. Um, and this is relative to how the SST. So we want to find out if we artificially reduce this SST bias, how does the Indian Ocean respond? Um, and we've done this by conducting some pacemaker experiments. So this is where we artificially restore the SST over this region in the tropical Pacific um, to what we want. And it lets us answer questions like, what happens if we reduce variability in the Pacific or what type of ENSO impacts Indian Ocean or Indian Ocean Dipole more? Or how does the mean state in the Pacific Ocean impact on the Indian Ocean? Um, so to do this, we, yeah, we've conducted these experiments. We've used, for the first set of experiments I'm talking about, we've used this restoring mask. It goes between uh, 15 north and 15 south and takes off to 20 degrees north and south um, with a, a damping. Um, the restoring time scale is six days over 10 meters. So it's equivalent to 30 days over 50 meters. Um, yeah, and these are the experiments that we've run. So we've got a 200 year long control. We've got a no answer experiment where we have restored to the seasonally varying model climatology. We've got a no answer, no bias, restoring to the seasonally varying had ISST. And then we've got an answer with no bias where we restore to the had ISST climatology, but add on the anomalies from the control. Um, so this lets us separate the influence of ENSO and the Pacific Ocean SST bias from uh, the Indian Ocean climate. Um, I'm just going to talk about the changes to ID here. So what we looked at first is the dipole mode index. Um, and here in the blue, I plotted the control. And then in the other colors are the other experiments. These error bars are based on some bootstrapping confidence intervals. Um, and what we see is that removing ENSO in both bias and no bias reduces the strength of the IID. Um, and that the Pacific Ocean SST 
Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say not. I think that figure's moved over a little bit. It's not a significant contributor to ID strain. Um, however, it does change the timing slightly. So in both of these no bias cases, the orange line and the red line, uh, ID typically starts uh, happening a little bit earlier than when there is the, the bias. Um, I also have experiments from another model, um, the French model syntax. Um, and they, it, it's not the exact same forcings or the exact same restoring either, but they've got an experiment which is restores over the Pacific, re removes ENSO in the same way using a climatology, and then one where they've done it for uh, the ob observed climatology. Um, and we see that this impact of ENSO seems kind of model dependent. Um, yeah, so ENSO appears to be a more dominant factor in Indian Ocean variability than the Pacific Ocean mean state is. Um, and this result has kind of informed what the next uh, stage was. So uh, because and so it seems so important to Indian Ocean dipole and Indian Ocean variability. We thought, what about the spatial biases in ENSO? So here we've plotted on the top row is a composite of East Pacific ENSO events, and on the bottom row, Central Pacific. And then the on the left is for HAD SST, and then on the right is in access CM2. Um, and this is classified using this PC1, PC2 method. Um, and we can see that access CM2 is quite equatorially confined. Um, and this is a common bias across CMIP class models. Um, and that the CP and so or CP El Nino uh, are typically too far east and west compared to the observations. And this anomalies are a little bit stronger. So how do these biases in spatial ENSO diversity affect the variability in the Indian Ocean? So we've run a new set of experiments uh, where we've restored over a slightly expanded region out to 20 north and 20 south, or 25 north and 25 south. And we've performed four experiments, um, two Central Pacific El Nino and two East Pacific El Nino, each forced by the HAD SST anomaly composite and the model SST anomaly composite. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, we've got 18 members of each of these. Um, however, creating some of these members proved kind of challenging. Um, so the first challenge is where do you initialize the model from? Well, we had, we had when, like restart dates from our control for every 10 years. So there's only 220 restart dates. Um, and we want reasonably neutral ENSO conditions like shown here. So we made sure that the EP index didn't meet the threshold in the year prior and so the CP. And then we also looked at the anomaly in January for that restart year. Um, our problem was that we only found five restart dates, so we have to find another method to get more ensemble members. Um, so the second thing we had looked at doing was we thought we could just branch these restarts by one day and create new restart files. However, um, to run the model for one day, it runs fine, but some of the post-processing scripts wouldn't uh, cooperate and needed, you need to make them handle any daily outputs instead of looking for monthly files, um, which I was not able to fix. However, um, due to the way the ocean monthly averaging works, once you restart from day two, it will then average January two to February one um, and give you wrong kind of monthly averaging. So I abandoned this method and looked at perturbing the atmosphere using uh, random noise, like this down below, um, and you add a perturbation at all levels via a script from Martin Dix. Um, however, we had some problems where this perturbation didn't seem to be applied unless you resubmitted the coupled job every month. 
or um, yeah, because when you submit it every year, it nothing happened. Um, I still don't really know why it happened. So we abandoned this method again, and we instead added that perturbation to our SST restoring file. So this is what the first time step of our restoring file looks like. Um, well, not, not the first time step, but this is what we've added onto that first time step. Um, so only the Pacific has that perturbation. Uh, sorry, this is cool. Um, and I think in a second, this animation will restart and you'll see what happens, um, how it quite very quickly within the first month diverges. Um, and so this is what we've done. And we have run, uh, yeah, the 18 members for each experiment from this. From the, yeah, the same five restarts, but adding in this different perturbation each time. Um, yeah, this is maybe a little bit clearer. This is day one SST and then the day 31. Um, and this is how the atmosphere responds. And you have monthly data, so um, I couldn't actually analyze the the daily atmospheric response. Um, so we've only just finished running these ensemble members, um, but we plan on, yeah, the way that we're analyzing them is looking at the SST in each member relative to the control climatology, uh, because two years isn't long enough to create an anomaly. Um, and we're looking at both the Indian Ocean Dipole and the Basin Water Warming. Um, so some initial results, we found that the IOD does not really appear to change under different El Nino conditions. So this is the ensemble average for each experiment um, for the DMI, and it, there's not really any coherent signal. Um, this is for each experiment broken down and um, yeah, so the, the faint lines are where it's not classed as an IOD event and then the, the solid lines are where it is. Um, and there's probably not really enough events happening here to be statistically significant. Um, yeah, so a lot more analysis to do here um, and to work out if we need to run more members or um, something else. The other thing I've looked at is briefly is the basin wide warming. This is a forced response to ANSO where um, after an ANSO event, you get this discharge into the Indian Ocean and it warms the whole basin. Um, and we find that these events happen a lot more with the EP El Nino. So both the EP ensembles get 15 out of 18 um, of these events happening. Um, yeah, any questions or comments, um, feel free to, to jump in. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Dietmar, you have your hand up. Oh, I'm just clapping. Oh, I sorry. Don't, I don't have my hand up. <laughs> sorry. But, but, but since you asked me, so it seems the obvious that the biases in the Indian Ocean are important, not the biases in the Pacific, right? I mean, um yeah it would it seems that way yeah um, but you you are you approach you cannot test that right i mean there's no way of testing how the indian ocean mean state biases would actually contribute to the iod being wrong um i i don't think you could test it with the pacemaker approach no um yeah unfortunately mm -hmm. I think you just have to make the model better to get rid of the bias to be able to know if it's causing it. But then by that point, it doesn't really matter. Do you, do you know what the biases in the Indian Ocean look like? Is the surface layer thickness very different? Is the mean state different or the mean winds? Um, yes. So I have a plot here for back near the start. Um, yeah, so overall, in access, it's a little bit too warm, especially in the, the West Pacific, too cool in the Arabian Sea. Um, however, across steam, it's 
class models, you typically get a, a cool bias in the East Indian Ocean. Um, but the, the biases are also seasonal in the Indian Ocean. Um, and yeah, some previous work I did looking at CMIP models, we looked at a heat budget. Um, and a lot of it is related to biases in wind. So where winds are too strong, you get either too strong or too weak, you either get like too much or too little um, like transport, and that leads to something not happening or tapping too much um, and making it too hot or too cold, depending on the region. But yeah, a lot of it is related to biases in wind too for the mean state bias. Gabriel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello. Um, thank, thank, thanks a lot for the talk. And just a quick question. Have you exactly evaluated how the access model, uh, how is this this teleconnection between ENSO and the IOD in the, in the access model? So if it really gets the, the correct uh, strength of this feedback or of or this teleconnection? Uh, yeah, so I have looked at that. Um, so I looked at that before conducting these experiments to see if it's worthwhile looking at. Um, how I didn't think to put a plot of that in here. Um, you do get you both like internally forced ID events, so ones that don't happen with an ENSO and ones that do happen at the same time. Um, so they like it, it appears to get both types of ID event. Um, yeah, but I think it's typically one way, and I think you get a few. On average, um, in compared to observations, you get more IDs happening without and so um yeah, so like in the the relationship is a bit more independent in this model compared to observations. Um, however, it is still there. Cool. Doesn't Thanks. this doesn't this suggest that it's really the problem in the Indian Ocean? Because it's not that Enzo drives too much. You're saying the ENSO impact is about realistic, but the IOD independent modes, which in the real world are fairly weak, are in the models too strong, which says that the internal interaction atmosphere ocean in the Indian Ocean in the models is just um, too sensitive, but it's too too unstable. Um, yeah, I guess it probably, I think it is. Like, you, you do get overly, you do, like, it most, coupled models have this overly strong ID bias. Um, yeah, so I think based on these results, it's not due to remote teleconnections, it's due to something happening in the Indian Ocean or just how the Indian Ocean is represented by itself. Um, so there must be something wrong in here rather than what's wrong here affecting this. And just one more, one more question. Have you investigated any bias in the ocean dynamics of the Indian Ocean or just in the atmospheric and, uh, and variability and surface variability? Um, in, so in these experiments, um, we've looked at kind of only really the surface ocean atmosphere interactions. Um, like looking at things like coupling strength um, and stuff like that. But yeah, we haven't really looked below the surface at all. Yeah, that's probably something to investigate. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, just for the complete picture, potentially the Atlantic could also play a role. You showed initially the mean biases in the tropics, and they were fairly big warm biases in the Atlantic uh, potentially could also influence the tropics, right? Yeah, yeah, they could. I think part of the, the motivation behind this is like, there's a much 
that there's typically like in the literature a lot more said about the relationship between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean rather than the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. Um, so yeah, I guess very yeah. But, but the, the, I think the logic is that um, what what matters in, in interactions is not necessarily absolute temperatures, but it's relative temperatures. And if you have the Atlantic being warmer than normal in the real world, the relative temperatures are biased. Right? That, that means yeah. the Indian Ocean is relatively cold, and therefore might have potentially different behavior. So it could be something different from what you observe because you have now a permanent too warm Atlantic. Yeah. I'm not saying it. I, I, I would also guess it might to first order not be relevant, but since you have the setup, um, just seeing whether the Atlantic mean state has any influence on this interaction. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. guess that it yeah. does I, much. I think, but... it, I think it'd be interesting to look at. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe it has more of an influence on Enzo itself than on the Indian Ocean, but it would be. Yeah. Interesting to see. That, um... A study by Dave By where he did Atlantic pacemakers, and those had they kind of fixed the power spectra of yeah. Enzo. Um, but there, that study didn't look at how it impacted the Indian Ocean. So it might be might be interesting to look at the like the actual data from that. Yeah. 